If you've been following me, I am building an EV charger with my company Cool Street for people who park on the street and elsewhere so that they can charge your EVs overnight, conveniently, just get all around all the issues that are coming up because of people not having access to charging. You look at studies today and they really say, wow, if all these people could only charge, there'd be so many more people that could drive electric cars. And it's a lot of people. Between multifamily and street parking, there is probably somewhere around 40 million people in the United States who do not currently have access to charging overnight where they park. And this is something I'm really working to solve. And so follow along for that. I'm also an engineer and that means I'm building stuff and I'm building prototypes. I've been building prototypes as part of this project. And we started way back in 2021 with the Mark I prototype, our very first prototype, this guy here. And I showed you a couple of weeks back how we made this, kind of what's inside of it, what was going on. It's very simple. It's kind of cobbled together from existing parts and solutions. And so we really demonstrated the form factor of this post charger. It's just a four by four steel post and the detachable cable and that it worked on the street for charging my car. These were kind of our big three things. Where we failed was in longevity and the electronics in this guy, they died in about six months. And so then I was left trying to fix that, create the next generation prototype. And the next generation was gonna be the Mark II, which you can actually see here. But before I did that, I created a 1.5. Interestingly enough, it was kind of a iteration on the one, but with better sealed electronics. You see it has a very similar outlet style to the Mark I, but it has a box and this is for all the electronics. You see it's really crammed in there and honestly I'm surprised this thing held up the way it did. You can see this cover is super warped after we took it out. But we have our main contactor. This is the same contactor as the Mark I. We've upgraded a few things in the way the wires connect. You see the current coil, the GFCI coil. Here's an extra little coupler for some grounds. We have the main control board hidden away down underneath and then the Wi-Fi board up here on top. And it's really just exactly the same electronics as the Mark I, crammed into a box quickly so that we could test it out to see if they would survive being out there in the weather in this scenario. And they did. This ended up working. Like I said, I'm surprised because this box was not very sealed well by the time we got it, um, by the time it was taken out. So the Mark 1.5 really demonstrated that we could put the electronics inside a sealed box in the post. And that really was effective at isolating them from the elements, preventing condensation, keeping everything a little bit drier in there. So we decided to move forward on that on the Mark II prototype, which I have here. And the Mark II is really an iteration that builds on that enclosed box inside, but also we went with a custom electronics package. And you'll see in a minute what that looks like and some of the issues we encountered with that. The other things that we did, we kind of cleaned up the design here of the socket. So the socket now is much more molded into the, the actual shape of this uh, uh, the enclosure and the box and everything like that. We made allowances to put some lighting on the top of the charger. Interestingly, every charger that is made has to have illumination for it to pass certification. And this is really important. It needs to show when you're charging, when there's an error, things like that. And so we wanted to put lights on this and we did that by putting some lights on the top of this post. The Mark II is very similar to the Mark I in the post and the post is still a four by four steel post. This one is welded to a three eighths inch uh, steel plate at the bottom and the welds aren't too great because I did that myself. I was trying to save money. But what does look nicer is we got it powder coated and the powder coating really helps prevent corrosion and, and rust from forming when this is sitting outside. It's a much more durable surface finish. To open this up, you pop off this beauty cover on the top and then beneath that, you can see this large translucent green cover. This is actually where the light would shine out of to illuminate around the Cool Street logo. There's a little slot in the back with a wedge mechanism stuck in it. So we back the screw out on this wedge mechanism and it falls apart because I did not design this properly and it tends to fall apart and we lose the pieces in the bottom of the post and then I have to fish them out, kind of a thing. So this wedge is a little broken, but you can see how it works. There is a bolt down the middle to a nut 
And when you tighten it up, it basically drives these wedges against each other, increases the thickness, and that wedges the electronics box inside the post. The cool thing is when the wedge is out, you can slip the box backwards, it unlocks from the hole in the post, and then you just slide it out the top and you have full access to the electronics box. So this was the very first Cool Street custom board. You can see it's pretty straightforward. We have power coming in from our supply. And then this is getting shuffled through the relay here on the left, and it's going out to the vehicle through this set of terminals. And these would connect into the socket in here. You have other power input things here going on on the board. And then all of the actual features that make this thing work are on the back side. So we have the charge controller uh, up here. This was a different microprocessor we were looking at. Uh, we have an ESP32 here for Wi-Fi communication, the external antenna that was going to go up in the, the top. And then there's a bunch of other things for the GFCI. Uh, you have things for generating the pilot signal, et cetera, and then pins and whatnot for doing communication, debugging, things like that. Yeah, so this thing didn't work. Uh, the first issue we had was actually on the varistor, which is not on here anymore. I took that off. It was the wrong size. It would trip circuit breaker as soon as I turned it on. And then the other thing I found was, I believe this cap here is on backwards, um, but there was other issues. You can see I have uh, drawing all over this. I was trying to figure out what was going on with the power supply, but just power was not getting where it needed to get. And that's about as far as we got. Um, until I realized I needed to start doing this on my own. And so I learned how to make PCBs because of this guy and the failure of this guy. If we flip it over, you can see there's a little cover here at the bottom. And this cover was for the electrician who was installing the unit. They would open up this little cover and you can see now they have access down into the power terminals for connecting in through this little grommet at the bottom here. We never actually used the Mark II. It sits here, it's made, it looks nice. I showed it to a few people, but we have actually never got it working. We never tested it. And it was a point in the project where I realized a key thing that I think was an important lesson to learn early on. And that was, I did not know how that board was made. So when my friend was less than responsive in working through the issues on that, it, the project really ground to a stop for a while. And at that point, I really had to hunker down and learn how to make my own electronics. And as a mechanical engineer, this isn't the most easy thing for me to do. And it took me probably about a year to get back up to the point uh, of where we were before. But we have gotten there, it's just this hiccup in the road. But the good part of all this is though, though it delayed us a little bit, it did teach me and allow me to learn all the things that are necessary to fully understand what's going on inside this thing. And that's super important so that we know not just the deployment and all that stuff, but also the physical hardware and all the nitty gritty of it. So when the problems do come up, because they will, or if we need to change something, we can do that really quickly. And as we go along, things have gotten faster and faster in how we're able to iterate through electronics. So I was really grateful for the lessons of the Mark II, even though I was super optimistic on this thing at one point, and eventually it was kind of like, yeah, might as well throw it out. This isn't gonna work. Um, and I moved on to the Mark III. So I wanna talk a little bit about why the form factor of this post has been my obsession for the past three plus years. It's really because when you begin putting charging in locations where people live, so residential neighborhoods, on the street in residential neighborhoods in particular, the form factor really, really matters. You do not want this charger out there that's 10, 12 feet tall looking like a gas pump. You're not going to want it. Your neighbors are especially not going to want it, especially if they're not too favorable to EVs. And so you really need something discreet. And as I said before, I, I played with things below ground, but ultimately moisture one out there it wasn't going to work and it was going to be really expensive so i decided to go back to say the classic hitching posts for horses back in the day just like a little post that you can put on the street you can take the cable off of it like they do in europe and that really eliminates all the cord clutter because the cords are what's leading to these giant retractor mechanisms in the big units or you're going to have it coiled around like these wall boxes up here and it's not the most attractive thing and I, I keep coming back to that form factor because unlike chargers in your garage, like these guys, when it's sitting out in front of your house, 
it's curb appeal, literally. It's right there in front of everybody and you want this thing to be invisible. So that's why we've spent a ton of time trying to get this form factor right, which is kind of different than most chargers. Most chargers care a lot more about other things, but I think for this application, form factor is, is just massively huge. And so bonus, here's the Mark III. The Mark III was really a development platform for the box more than anything. So we don't have a post, we don't have electronics for this guy. But what we did do is we changed up the socket. So we put the socket perfectly horizontal. You see that here. It's the first socket that is not facing downward. And we put a door on it to cover it up when it's not in use. Now this door isn't very great. It's just gravity driven right now. But it was our first door, our first attempt at a door, how we would lay out the door, how we open the door, things like that. We also tried out a different mounting mechanism in the box or in the post. You'll see there's these bolts here that go through the, the actual box. And on the back side of them is a little hex nut. This hex nut is tightened up through the mounting holes for the socket. And then you put the socket um, attaching screws on top of that once you get it secured into the post. So there's another interesting way to wedge this box into the post. We never did build the post for this. We never did build the electronics. We never tested it. It was really just getting form factor iterations updated. And so it's not a true prototype in that regard, but we still call it the Mark III. But up next is the Mark IV. You just drop the box in. It can't fall in because of this plate on top. Slide it out and then drop your wedge in. That gets held in there as well. And then tighten up the bolt. And you see that wedges into the outside edge here. Let me simply pop the cover on. 